All right, everybody. How you doing? It is, what is it? It's Thursday, December 15th. Brigadoon Radio. We're back with our good friend, Gerald Ashley. Year ends. Look ahead. All kinds of exciting stuff happening. Gerald, how you doing? Uh, I'm fine. I'm a little bit cold. I always, re- like all English people, I always report on the weather. Six to eight weeks ago, or maybe 12 weeks ago, we were all cooking in so-called tropical conditions. Now the mercury is plunged to, wow, minus three, which is hardly anything in large parts of the world. But of course, in Britain, this is thought to be Arctic conditions and the whole world's coming to an end. Uh, hence, I'm wearing a sweater. But um, other than that, things are fine. And um, we're getting close to the holiday season. And um, we've got the usual tradition in the UK of lots of public service strikes. So we've got strikes <laughs> by postmen, nurses, railway drivers, um driving instructors the guys who take your test for you if you're doing a driving license they've gone on strike lord knows how important that is so it's a bit of a 1970s rerun here at the moment but other than that i'm quite cheerful (laughs) perfect well that's a good segue to our first topic inflation what is going on in the world is the world inflated um i don't know the fed yesterday Raise the basis points. I don't really have, I don't know. I, I find the Fed, I don't know. I just find it interesting. <laughs> just sitting around a bunch of bureaucrats tinkering with the economy. I just find it endlessly entertaining the amount of coverage it gets. But uh, I don't know. Inflation's here. It seems to be slowing down the states, but it seems to be accelerating other parts of the world. I, don't, I really think it depends on what you're trying to buy in your life if inflation matters. Um, I don't know. What do you say? Yeah, I mean, obviously the people on strike <clears throat> are saying, hey, the world's getting more expensive. Our wages yeah. need to go up. Um, and they probably have a point. What do you say? I mean, do, is this something we should be paying attention to? Well, I, I mean, I think from a political point of view, it's a nightmare for all the reasons you've just said. Um, and it, it's opened out in, into people actually going on strike and, and wanting wanting more money. And they've this has been delayed a little bit because it's taken about a year or so for people to realise just how much their grocery basket has gone up, just how much, you know, refueling the car every week or however often is pretty expensive. That said, funnily enough, the oil price is starting to come down here. And so we may have, we're not exactly seeing cheap fuel in the UK, but it's it's considerably less than it has been over the last few months. Um, (coughs) Excuse me. Um, I think... Inflation is around for quite some time. Some people believe it will disappear as quickly as it arrived. And they're banking on the fact that we go back to China being the big engine of uh, world growth and prices right. push and all the rest of it. I'm, I'm not so certain about that, to be honest. <coughs> Excuse me. Now I've managed to get a winter cold as well. <laughs> just in time yeah, just for, no, uh, for no think- medical services. Yeah, so I think if you're a central bank, I mean, I think the criticism has been made, I think, quite correctly, that they were slow to react on the way up. They may now overreact at the top. I mean, I've heard the phrase said that, you know, the Fed's going to be standing on the brake just as the engine stalls. Um, though I'm not certain the engine is stalling the United States. As you say, I think there's signs that the, the US might pull out of this in reasonable shape or form. I think... We've kind of run like this seventy year, this fifty year cycle. I, I was at an event earlier this week with David Rubenstein and uh, you know Carlisle Group, the one of the wise men of the U.S. And um, he was chatting. He worked in the Carter White House, and I think Volcker was the Fed chairman back in the day. And yeah. you know he said, "Listen, the Fed used to they used to not say what they're doing. They used to and they used to not say why they're doing it, right? And now we have a Fed that tells you." why they did it and what they're going to do. And I'm not sure that's really helped anybody. This transparency, the amount of media coverage and the idea of tinkering around the economy. I don't know. It's yeah. just very diverse. And we've got a much more interesting, dynamic global economy. And I just wonder that the Fed is using a basket of tools that are quite frankly outdated. And they're not, you know, there's no, uh, even letting alone like the measurement of software, or, you know, even this call, like there's no GDP measurement. Well, uh, there shouldn't be a GDP measurement for this call. But I mean, It'd the fact huge. that we can do this now, there yeah, must. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure that's reflected in the overall economy. You know, so um, I just wonder that they're using a bad basket of tools, and just the amount of media coverage it kind of feeds upon itself. You know, when you have reporters telling people in the street, "Hey, you're feeling the inflation price," 
they're all, more nine times out of ten they're going to say yes, and I think it yeah. kind of feeds upon itself. I think I think there's a degree of truth in that, and it, it makes it very difficult to get on top of that narrative and to explain to the people that prices will, will stop rising so quickly. Um, they're certainly not going to go back down unless we had global defra- uh, deflation of enormous enormous consequence. Um, and of course, a usual topic of ours, none of this plays well with the political cycle. Right. Because, um, it may slightly favor the US administration more than it does the European ones in that um, maybe the US is a little further in the cycle and the worst, you know, the pain will be over or won't be so great as it well uh, likely to be in the UK and in Europe. Um, the one, the one thing that hasn't happened, which is probably key to all of this, is unemployment. We haven't seen a massive increase in unemployment. Now, unemployment is normally a, a lagging indicator in all these things, anyhow. Right. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be the likelihood that there's going to be mass unemployment. There's certainly been some black spots. I think last time we spoke, we talked about the tech sector letting go a lot of people and uh, you know, right. a variety of areas like that. But it, I don't sense anywhere that um, unemployment is going to be a, a massive problem. We have a we have a bizarre problem in the UK where we've got um, more job vacancies than there are unemployed, but we just don't seem to be able to match the two. Now, um, is that because there's a skills gap? Maybe. Is it because there's a lot of people, maybe baby baby boomers, slightly younger, over you know over the age of fifty, who have just departed the uh, employment market? And are not desperately excited about the thought of going back. Now, if things get tough on a monetary front, will more people reappear in the market? Uh, uh, reappear in the marketplace. So I, I just sense that this is a story that will rumble. I think inflation will fall next year, um, but maybe the gloom and doom is a little bit over, overstated for next year. Yeah, I was joking with somebody. This is the greatest pre-recession recession I've ever been a part of. I mean, you know, I, it's been the most telegraphed recession that has never arrived. Um, yeah, I just, I generally just think we're at a year, we're at a twenty-year end. We're at a twenty-year kind of bull run of yeah. kind of globalization, tech, um, war in Ukraine. There's more geopolitics than I've certainly ever experienced in the last two decades. So. I just think we're, we're entering a new environment and we have leadership around the world using old measurements, old tools mm-hmm. to try to figure out what's going on. And the Fed has this weird dual mandate. They have a dual mandate of keeping prices reasonable, right? That is like not to have inflation run out of control and to seek full employment. And I think this kind of dual mandate mission may have been easier in a world in the 70s than it is in the 2020s. So, um, yeah, I think you're right. And I think the other thing, as you say, is all the metrics are screwed up these days. How do you, you know, when are people at work? When are people doing right. economically active activity or whatever the phrase is? I mean, it's much more blurred. Um, and I suppose in all economies, there are there are winners and losers. And there's some structural change. Um, the, stru- the structural change definitely, I think, favours people um with a kind of tech background so if you're you know even if you're north of 35 certainly if you're north of 45 and you're a little bit of a tech dinosaur um you're going to become i wouldn't say unemployable but you're not going to have much of a job um there's huge demand uh for for people um in the tech sector and that that's not going to go away well, that could be true, but I think there's also a resurgence in kind of manufacturing assembly, you know, uh, people that bank, can bend steel. Um, I think we're going to be laying a lot more concrete here in the U.S., construction. So I don't know. I, I'm kind of bullish on the future. I think it's going to be kind of exciting. But I just think we're, we're at the end of a 20-year run. We're kind of entering a new economic paradigm. I think, I think one thing you could argue in favor of, which is maybe a counter to what I've just been saying about tech, is that we are due an enormous infrastructure reset. We, you know, everywhere you go, everybody needs to be doing more on road, rail, um, transport in general, um, and just the, the general standards of of of, um, of quality of product. And 
as you say, that could be a huge amount of spending in, into the economy. Um, it will lead to a mindset of, of investors thinking differently because we, we may be coming towards the end of uh, money for nothing investment. You know, uh, our favorite topic of, um, uh, of uh, you know, all these e products that don't really add up to anything. Well, I think if uh, I, mean, I was, I've been watching some of the FTX hearings on Capitol Hill and just paying yeah, attention yeah. to uh, our good friend Sam down there in the Bahamas. Uh, supposedly in one of the worst jails on the planet. I don't mean to laugh, but um, yeah, I don't know that whole. <laughs> yeah, I mean the whole thing is is eight billion dollars gone. You could say this is this is exactly the sort of symptoms you get towards the end of a free money period. Right, you have thrown so much money at everything. And that money, as we've said so many times before, that money has to go somewhere. There's right. been no, there's been no yield, so people have bought into all sorts of wacko schemes that are, that are going to make money. And it's it's really interesting, I find, that soon as the cost of money comes back, ergo uh, interest rates go up, all this starts to fall off a cliff. Yeah. All of a sudden, it... people think, well, hang on, you know, there's no yield or return on this. I'm buying it simply because I can't think I can sell it to you for a higher price. And it's a gigantic version of the shell game, I think. And, um, There's a story out of Canada around their COVID funding, uh, I don't know, like billions of dollars. You know, like, I mean, I, I have to find the story. Maybe it was $10, 20000000000 billion out of Canada. That was, you know, mismarked. It just it went to, just into the vapor. Where did that money go? That's just Canada. You know, I mean, well, the amount of money we dumped in the economy the is pretty well. Is, the thing is, it was never there in the first place. And this is kind of the difference between money and credit, that a, a lot of all of these schemes and stuff have, have created huge, great credit bubbles, and they'll just inflate back to nowhere. Um, if you manage to get in at the bottom and then out of the top, fantastic. Very few will. Much more likely if you've managed to get in at the top and now find, you know, it's worthless, you will have lost some real dollars. But... Um, it's a rebalancing in a way. Um, I, I forget the initials. So they are they FTPs? These things are copies of oil paintings and you watermark. N them. NFTs. NFTs. Thank you very much. Non fungible, whatever they was. Yeah. The, the, tokens. The, the, yeah, non fungible tokens. Yeah, that whole thing is just nonsense squared, and everybody knows it's nonsense squared. And here we are. I think you know it, it, there'll be a residual value to them. You know, a bit like kids swapping baseball cards and things like this. But it's not going to go back to this tens of millions of dollars stuff. I don't think anything. Oh, man, that's very depressing. My whole my whole is world is your, NFTs. Is this your entire pension? Thing? I have some NFTs to sell you, but we could talk about that offline. <laughs> Let's pivot to uh, Ukraine. Um, there was a great story. Well, I wouldn't say great. I was very well reported in the London Times about this trench warfare You've certainly talked about it um, on your recommendation. I also watched All Quiet on the Western Front. I was completely mesmerized. What a film. Um, just And the reporting, if you haven't seen the story of the London Times, you can share it. But we're back to trench warfare. I mean, they're going back and forth. They're just, there's really nothing happening. They're slogging it out. They're running out of ammunition on both sides. Um, complete deadlock. What a mess. Where do we go from here? Um, I, I suspect nowhere in the short term, and that may even be the medium term. Um, just to put a little bit of color on the on the geography of things. You remember there was this big push by the Ukrainians successfully to push the American um, the Americans to push the Russians, uh, um, you know, back further east, and they've retreated to the Dnieper, a uh, hugely difficult river to to bridge and get over, and they've got large concrete emplacements and positions again, just like. The First World War with the Siegfried Line and all the rest of it. And I, I suspect we're, we're in some sort of stalemate here. It's winter, so obviously it's going to be conditions are going to mean there's far less in the way of fighting. But it, it, I think the mainstream media doesn't know what to do with it because it's become a dreadful thing to say, but it's become a boring story. There are no, there are no sudden, you know, there's yeah. no new news. There's no new news, which, again, is exactly what happened in the First World War. Um, and so the solution is going to be geopolitical. And that may be that there is no solution in the same way as we must remind ourselves that Crimea was invaded in 
2014. Correct. We're not. We're nine years into this, and there's no way the Russians are moving from there, and nobody's got the strength to heave them out, and so we're just sort of stuck in this in this position. Um, what that means longer term for for policy, where people have said, you know, we've got to pile on more restrictions and more sanctions on the Russians, um, and it has to be said, one wonders to to what effect. At what stage are people going to have to say, well? Is this a de facto state of affairs and we have to redraw the map? But I think that's going to take many years for people in the West to swallow. You think you were many years away from this? Yeah, you could wow. be very many, I think. Because I can't see either side, you know, in the normal sense of the word, winning. You know, Russia's not going to be defeated. It's own, the only thing would come an internal collapse, right. a regime change, and they retreat back to their border. But, uh, you know, this is much talked about, but there's, there's no evidence for it. And there's certainly, I agree with you, I mean, they're certainly not going to leave Crimea. And the West, from day one, has never really aggressively told the Russians, you're going to leave Crimea. Um, even today, yeah, there's a report on the State Department, more sanctions. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's more reports, too, about crazy weapons like Patriot missile systems, these JDAM missiles. Like, I don't, You don't know if it's a PSYOPs around it. Uh, the Republicans are going to take over the House of Representatives, I think, in 13 days, maybe 18 days, January 3rd, start of the new year. Um, I don't know. It, it's a bit of a slog. There's also, it's interesting, Macron is playing an interesting role. They have a the classic, you know, French-Russian, I don't want to say alliance, but they've certainly been closer. And, you know, I think France and Russia yeah. have an interesting relationship and where Putin is probably closest to Macron out of anybody in Europe. And can Macron, you know, create a deal? But then, you know, what do the Ukrainians say? I mean, they certainly have a say, but I don't know. I'm, I'm depressed to hear you're going to say it's going to be years off. Um, it seems to me that Zelensky, I don't know. If I was, I, I don't know. It's, it's he's cool. in a tough position. You know, where's the breakout? If, if uh, we wake up one morning and there's been a coup in Russia and there's a general who we've never heard of is suddenly running things and Putin is carted off to a dacha in the middle of nowhere, um, does that actually change Russian policy? I'm not certain that it would. It could be you get an even worse version of Putin. That's um, the challenge, right? Yeah. Yeah. And on the other side... But this week, though, uh, you know, Schultz there in Germany said, you know, in a press conference or something, he was asked about this. He said that, you know, he would be happy to return to uh, German-Russian economic activity if some kind of solution is there. So there's, you know, there there is talk of something happening. But you're right. I mean, is if Putin le Putin leaving is probably <laughs> even worse for the yeah. world. Yeah. No, there's no easy solution to this. And I, um, Western public opinion is still extremely pro-Ukraine, I think much more than many European governments are. The British government continues Boris's policy of being very pro-Ukraine, but I think with the best will in the world is pro to a certain point, and the pro to a certain point is this sort of old-fashioned idea, well, this isn't fair, you can't go around bombing people and then and quite naturally and robbing their land and everything. And so there's, there's this moral feeling that we can get restitution. But I don't think the West has got the wherewithal to do it. You know, you, 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 we're not putting boots on the ground to keep the Russians out, right? It's not like that. No, exactly. I mean, like, you can, like, the thing to pay attention to is what is happening, right? Actions as opposed yeah. to talk. And I think, um, yeah, until uh, NATO troops are anywhere aggressively in Ukraine, um, we're rid of a loggerhead. And the other thing is, you know, this also presupposes that Putin doesn't make a misstep and do something stupid, like have a go at the Baltic states or anything of that nature. Provided everything stays where it is, staying where it is, is going to be the de facto situation. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, it's like, you know, you balance something on its end and it falls over until it finds a point of stability. And it's found some form of stability this war now. And I, yeah. I think it's going to be quite difficult to shake on either side. Well, speaking of stability, Turkey, what is happening? Erdogan well, had the mayor of Istanbul arrested for uh, I'm not saying I can't. Uh, allegedly. Well, no, what should I say? The Turkish uh, judicial system determined that the mayor of Istanbul violated some rules who just happened to be one of Erdogan's biggest potential challengers in an election. 
was arrested and possibly is out. And um, I don't know. He's like also creating trouble with the Greeks. What is happening in Turkey? You're our expert uh, Turkish well, well, uh, yeah. expert. Yeah, thank you. We 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 no no worries there. Then. I mean, I think you know, in really broad colours, Turkey's a complex country. There's just been this huge tension over the last hundred years between secular and the religious uh, religious element. The religious element's been pretty much top dog again now for the first time. Uh, in the last 20 years, it's really built up under Ergen and, and all the rest of it. There's a big split between rural versus city, sophisticated versus the less sophisticated. Wow, it so sounds, like sounds like the United States. Yeah, well, it <laughs> sounds pretty much like everywhere. And it, it, you've got this situation where Ergen has managed to bridge all of that. This is a country that's a full member of NATO that has... Um, uh, been threatening another NATO member, ergo Greece, um, has had all sorts of bilateral talks with the Russians and is now trying to set up a tripartite set of talks between Russia itself and the various actors in Syria and uh, the surrounding area. Um, so they're, they're, somebody's either playing a very foolish or a very clever game, and I, I suspect that they're, they're, they're playing a clever game very well. Um, and what I think that means is um, that any future editions of this wonderful podcast, if we manage to get on air again, if we're allowed to be, um, I think <laughs> Turkey is Turkey is going to be a theme for next year because they're going to weave in and out of the politics and the military balance and to an extent the tech balance. I mean, they provided these really quite sophisticated drones to the Ukrainians at the same time as they seem to be coating up to the Russians in the Middle East. So it's all, you know, somebody's playing both ends against the middle here. And, and so far, that, that seems to be working. Um, yeah, I agree. Like, Turkey, well, they, we should tell our listeners, they're scheduled to have an election uh, on yeah. January and June 18th of 2023. So we're like six, what, six, seven months away from that. Um, but Turkey, I agree. It's like really, I mean, from a ge from a geography standpoint, it's in quite a crossroads. Uh and it's also playing very smart geopolitics. And also, I think in this new, like, as we talk about the economy, right in this kind of new geopolitical world, you know, Ian Bremmer talks about it being G0. There's really nobody running it. Uh, yeah. These kind of middle powers like Turkey seem well positioned to kind of play everybody all sides because everybody really needs them. And uh, they're taking full advantage of it. I, I, you would think like Turkey 10, 15 years ago couldn't have done this. But in this new environment, they're like, this is a prize. This is go time for them. Yeah, I think it's, I think, how to put it, the, the world is much looser. It's got, you know, right. many more lo loose sort of uh, relationships and groupings than in the past. And this allows Turkey to sort of jump about and play different games with different people. Um, whether that will pan out long term, you know, remains to be seen. But they're clearly. You know, there are a couple of people we haven't talked about in this mix, and the most important one is probably Iran. And, of course, also Israel. So there's this whole tension uh, between those three as well. And um, maybe, again, it's one of these things that there's just the right amount of balance to hold everything in place. So nobody is quite top dog. So if, if, if Iran looked like becoming top dog, you know, that... That would be exceptionally serious. I mean, maybe this, this could be your next book, The Flying Buttress Geopolitics, right? It's a I mean, delicate balance of yeah. architecture no. and, you know, the flying buttress world economy. It may be, and I know you're the world's greatest optimist, but it may be that it's <laughs> maybe it's pessimism that's gluing everything together. And, and it, 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 it's just. Well, it's dicey because as soon as you mention, you know, Israel and Syria, then I'm out of me, I'm going to like Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Qatar, Iran. I mean, yeah. and then you're like, oh, then like, let's start talking about Pakistan. Oh, by the way, the Indians and the Chinese had a scuffle on the border last week. I mean, yeah. well, <laughs> you're like, <laughs> we were talking about the 1970s here in England. Welcome back to the 1970s, where yeah. they, they almost had two sort of mini wars about these things. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that hasn't gone away again. So we're we're back to. Um, our favourite author, Tim Marshall, in his books on the geography of geopolitics. He should be paying us commission because we always say how much we like his books. They're brilliant. 
And it makes the point that geography and economic flows trump a lot of what goes on in the world. And those tensions and and flashpoints is, are still there, basically. 100%. I mean, maps matter, more probably more than ever. And uh, getting yeah. smart on geography will well suit a lot of politicians. Unfortunately, you won't find many of them in Congress, but that's okay. <laughs> Let's talk, speaking of getting smart, can we talk about the German coup? The coup d'etat? The I mean, I don't want to speak too lightly of this, but well, the rest of the 2,000 people, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, is this something we should be alarmed about? Is it serious? Um, is it just well, is it just I, Germany or I don't know, you know, because it it maybe it reveals our ignorance of what, you know, is under the surface in Germany. Um like any country, there are always groups of wackos who want to um, you know, impose their way of the world on things, whether they're religious groups or far extreme political groups. Uh, this one was a new one on me. I can't remember the name of the guy. Is he Heinrich the Seventh or something? He's calling himself Prince. Yeah, uh, I, we'd have to dig it out. But uh, yeah, yes. there's Prince but, but title, the, several names and uh, numbers. All, sort of, all of, in amongst all the sort of Ruritanian comedy of the whole thing, is there? There may maybe one or two slightly more alarming elements. There, I mean, these guys they hadn't just organised this down the local pub. They had actually thought about this for years to the extent they'd, um, I think I'm writing saying a very senior Berlin judge was um, labeled to be the sort of home home minister or whatever it would be, or yeah. justice minister. And um, you have to wonder, well, you know, what, what tempts some people to make these sort of, uh, sort of statements and ideas. Um, maybe the broader point is there's a lot of dissatisfaction in Germany. Uh, maybe it doesn't show itself in many ways um it's a relatively we shouldn't overstate the case but it's a relatively weak co coalition herr schultz is kind of keeping it together but he's he's again having to face in about four different directions at the same time um and i i just wonder if there, it's a slight example of when you've got weak government and people who you know not thinking straight or not thought through consequences think it's an opportunity for them to you know seize control or whatever it may be. yeah weak government coupled with you know a weaker economy or kind of uh you know what we were just talking about i mean the world is a bit uh on edge it's a bit more pessimistic and but these you know, things are always these things are, are never far away was it your memory may be better than mine was it two or three years ago a couple of french generals maybe you had two or three too many brandies and decided maybe they should be running France and not Monsieur Macron. And I think they were very quickly shuffled off to a to a retirement home or something somewhere. <laughs> not been heard of since. Um, and the you know we always think these things will never happen here. They always happen elsewhere. But we had situations in the 1970s where all sorts of strange military um, retired officers thought that the country was finished in the mid 1970s in Britain and they'd have to take action. But it's normally a symptom of of of, of a malaise, really. And yeah, and these be, these people offer um, probably bonkers ideas, but people are worried that mainstream politicians are are out of ideas. You know, we've got. I'm keen to see too uh, the the backstory too, because I, I imagine that the German officials were monitoring this. You know, this group. This cabal for several years it wasn't just something they just yeah, stumbled you, upon you, and yeah. you wondered why now they decided to uh kind of make the move and bust up the ringleaders it's it's got a netflix documentary series all over it isn't 100 percent. i mean like most things you know i learn about the world via netflix why yeah. read anything anymore just go <laughs> to netflix so um is it an important thing no it's not uh, in itself is it just a very faint signal of, of malaise and dissatisfaction? Probably. And I think mainstream politicians, you know, mainstream politicians have got to, maybe you've got to alter, uh, alter their ways a little bit and, and, and offer more alternatives. In the UK, we, we increasingly, as far as I can see, we have one party who, whoever's in. Does it really matter now who Labour or Tory wins? I mean, it seems completely. Oh, here we go. No, you're like Noam Chomsky, man. Jesus. Yeah, no, of course it matters. Not. No, no, no. But uh, look, we've got a Tory government that's got eye-watering socialist levels of taxation. So, and and what is the socialist 
opposition idea to this, probably to increase taxation. Listen, so man, as we know. discussed, socialism, it just hasn't been fully tried yet. Until yeah, it's fully tried, we'll never know. Yeah, no, I know, and that's what worries me. <laughs> it's an experiment I can't afford. Speaking of experiments, let's talk about the breakthrough, the fusion breakthrough that the U.S. announced this week. You, before we came on air, were downplaying it. I don't know, maybe yeah, a little bit I, of um, this, this, English, English jealousy, but this, yeah, is, a, ooh, this is a big yeah. deal, man. The well, eagle has be, landed. No, it can't be any good if it's not British, as we know. Our good, <laughs> our good friend Rory, Sir, uh, Rory Sutherland has a great phrase, which goes back to the 1940s, which the Americans very dismissively of the British used to say, let the British be first and with the worst. In other words, we often invent things and then don't quite know what to do with it. But in this case, um, the Americans seem seem to be in the lead. Um, I'm going to invoke what I call my uh, rule about water on Mars. And every five, seven, ten years, there's a big breakthrough that there's water on Mars. And then, hey, presto, it turns out that NASA or the, you know Jet Propulsion Labs or whoever it may be need a load more money. And in Uncle Sam... Uh, duly writes a check. Now that I think would be a little bit unfair to the Lawrence Livermore Laboratories in this case, but you know we've waited a very long time for fusion. And if you read, there's quite a good article in Nature magazine saying let's not get overexcited about this, even if even if it is a net plus on the energy. And some people are arguing about that because of the sheer grunt power of lasers required. Um, even if that is the case, the engineering challenge is, is uh, um, you know, I mean, it's bonkers. Any... It's absolutely like when you listen to like this thing only lasted na I don't know, nanoseconds. I mean, yeah. the requirement and the amount of so, money, I think this test alone cost 100K. Yeah. Um, it's absolutely, it's absolutely bonkers. The requirements. It, it, it's sort of, it, you know, we're not going to be turning on the lights next year thanks to, to fusion electricity Is but i think the other the backstory though i think which probably hasn't got as much notice which i found more interesting there's actually a nuclear weapon component to this test as well uh mm -hmm. and I, that is the immediate impact in the last yeah. two weeks the u.s has unveiled this amazing b-21 raider jet that has 6g you know six generation technology has the, the range of the world, which is absolutely <laughs> amazing. Um, and then this, and I think, you know, the U.S. stockpile is going through a bit of a metamorphosis. We're due to spend billions of dollars to kind of upgrade it. So even this test, obviously there's clean energy, which makes everybody feel good. But there's also a nuclear we weapon component that is equally, uh, if not more so in the short term, more important, especially the folks yeah. in Beijing and Moscow. I think you're right in the we often forget that the defense dynamic in any of these things is always huge and very important. And I, I take your point. Uh, in, a, in a sense, I think we'll say we're both right here. I can see the, the defense thing. Um, whether it's going to lead to energy in any meaningful time frame, I think is different. It also, I wonder if it's not actually where the next big game in town is. Everybody, you know, electric cars, electric this and everything. I, I just still think that, the, you know, we're talking about whether we're going to go into a new era for the next 20, 30 years, whether the big developments are going to be in biology. But a lot of the, uh, a lot of the computing power is going to come from, from the research work. No, you're 100%. You think about these knuckleheads down in the Bahamas, you know, spending all this time and energy creating thick money. Imagine... You know, if they spent like 10% of their time saying, hey, how can we make desalination better? How can we improve, you know, yeah, the execution might, of uh, yeah. organ transfers? I mean, yeah, I agree. it's and just it might, totally crazy. Might be a, a signal that that part of digitization has been done. And I mean, that, Uber you know, Eats, you know, sending me a burrito faster takes, yeah. you know, 100 kids from Stanford. I mean, give me a break. Shouldn't we be working on something that is like... Life changing, like energy. So, and there's actually a story today in the Wall Street Journal: fusion industry suddenly white hot. So, yeah, um, yeah. the money should be pouring into that. And I think you're right. I mean, this around in nature, energy. It's kind of an exciting period. I think I'm yeah, actually no, pretty and I know bullish we, on that. I think our viewers characterize us as you're cheerful, and I'm always the 
pessimistic one, but I think I am pretty optimistic about scientific developments. But as you said, not in this this sort of um, electronic casino that doesn't really add up to anything. I mean, given your, you know, depending on your view of the world of religion, but let's just assume you're on the planet once. Is it the most interesting thing to have spent your entire life uh, on, you know, the, the sort of Bitcoin and all this stuff? I think it's a, it's a sideshow, I think, to be honest. I mean, listen, especially if you're going to embezzle $8 billion and not even, I mean, Bernie Madoff at least bought stuff. He bought yachts. He, like, bought art. <laughs> I mean, I don't, like, these kids in the Bahamas, what do they buy? I don't, uh, anyways. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, I, in a way, I think this is why we have such disdain for them. Because... Did they commission, yeah, I mean, do they even, like, commission a, a symphony or something? I mean, it's just yeah. totally madness. <laughs> Love right. Let's go to the other side of the world. Japan, I think, you're right, I think Turkey for 2023 is a good country to watch. For me, Japan, 2023 is a country to watch. They are aggressively spending, they're trying to increase the military budget. They're desperately getting more security deals with the UK, Australia. They're kind of uh, unfurling themselves from this, their tradition, their constitutional requirements of being yeah. uh, peaceful, if you will. Um, I don't know. I think they're a country to watch. I mean, they're a superpower, tremendous amount of money, education, wealth, interest, economy, uh, engineering, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, and pop culture. I mean, Japan, to me, seems the country to watch in 2023. I think... Um... Again, we're going to be in violent agreement here. I think um, there are a couple of huge problems in Japan, of which the obvious one is demographics. Right. Um, and, well, that is really the, the, the big issue. Unless they can somehow get through and out the other side of that, it's going to be incredibly difficult. But we kind of tend to forget they're the third largest economy in the world. They're enormously inventive. I know there's this idea that, oh, well, Japan, all they ever did was miniaturize everything we'd already done and all the rest of it. It's simply not true. The, the huge amount of, um, of innovation and, and inventiveness in Japan. And then again, on one of your favorite topics, I think they're a hidden uh, soft power, superpower. That they... listen, listen to this number, Gerald. Last week, I, or the, earlier this week, I discovered the Japanese anime market, right? The, the cartoon yeah. anime is a $20 billion market. Yeah. I was absolutely staggered. I mean, uh, are you kidding me? That is like, and it, it seems to me it's only growing. I mean, yeah, talking about soft power, sushi, food, and baseball. That, yeah, and it all it all going to play into, um, you know, this whole thing of gaming and when does gaming leak over into the real life and real life into defense again and all this stuff. And the other thing on the soft power, one, and I think this is another one of these year end quiz questions, which is which is the uh, city in the world with the most um, Michelin uh, three star restaurants? It's Tokyo. Yeah. You know, it's not Paris. It's not Lyon. Uh, it's not London, New York. Nice pronunciation of Lyon. Yeah, well, they are. We're very international here. We're very international. <laughs> Keller, uh, no, you're spot on. I think the soft power, uh, yeah, I think it's a country to watch. It's a lot of interesting stuff. And uh, the history of Asia has really been defined by China being strong, Japan being weak. I don't know. Uh, Japan has certainly been on the back seat for the last few years. If Japan becomes stronger, what does that mean for China? It's all very interesting, which we leads us to. We've got two jokers in the pack with that. One is Taiwan. And the other Here one. Here we is, go. Ah, yeah, ah. we're going to finish up with Taiwan. Yeah, that is the joker in the pack. What do we think? Invasion 2023 or no? No, no. so that's a hostage to fortune straight away. But <laughs> I, I don't think so. I think the Americans have done enough, either visibly or more importantly, in back challenge, uh, back channels to, to sort of mark President Xi's card on that. I mean, was it three months ago? Uh, lots of journalists were excitedly expecting World War Three because Nancy Pelosi uh, uh, flew to uh, to Taiwan. I mean, um, I think you were very early to spot that. You know, this was a, been planned meticulously with the Chinese two months earlier or something, but didn't didn't stop a big sort of fluster um, in, in the press and everything. But no, I think since there, there's been delegations from literally every NATO country. I, I think the Japanese. Who's the uh, the foreign minister? I don't know if Cleverly's been there yet, but um, 
the British have sent, the Germans have sent delegations. I mean, yeah, the, the Pelosi coverage was sensational. Yeah, like, I think, just I, like I just crazy. Want, yeah, it, it, it seemed a bit mad. But in terms of what happens next, I suppose one of the longer term things, maybe the world is waking up to the risks of concentration in Taiwan and to a lesser extent South Korea of microprocessor production. Yeah. You know, we've seen Biden out in Phoenix a few weeks ago hailing a new microprocessing plant and all the rest of it. There'll be a lot more of that, I would have thought. Um, and you may see a little bit of a, a broadening out of our exposure uh, to those supply chains. But in no, there's a great story this week in the FT about Europe. Uh... Getting yeah, I mean they've got they've got some chip capabilities, but getting really to the microprocessor level, really you know getting to the game so to speak. But it's not even just the assembly of the chips. I, I didn't realize. I mean the chemicals that are necessary and chemical yeah. plants and infrastructure, which Europe has, and yeah, I think you're going to see a lot more, less concentration in Asia, around chips going forward. And speaking of Tim Marshall, he had some crazy stat that the average javelin missile, right? Those rocket, the shoulder held hmm. rocket. It's an amazing weapon. It has 250 chips in it. So, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, the amount of chips we're using are just, it's just mind boggling. So that's another big thing too. I mean, energy and also spreading out of supply chains could be the next big story, which is really an infrastructure story. Yeah, and it, it, it will play interestingly politically in the States about, you know, supporting everybody back home by reshoring high value jobs and this type of thing and all politicians around the world will play will play those sort of stories i'm sure the big the big word now is friend shoring so if you can't bring it back if you can't reshore to the states at least friend shore it that is like send it to a friend of the united states so canada do you have any, do you have any friends do you have any friends do i i have friends do, <laughs> does america have friends no <laughs> We only have, and it must be some great Kissinger quote, right? Yeah. We only have no, interest. Yeah, again, it, it, and isn't that a sort of, uh, a sort of natural progression with these things? That the, the the overarching word in all of this is security. And right. Well, twenty twenty two has frightened people on security on loads of fronts, whether it's cyber, food, just physical security because the war in Ukraine. Um, as you said, supply chains in general. Um, and I think maybe the West has had a free ride on a lot of this stuff and not really invested in it or think thought it through in, in quite the same way in the past. But I think it's the big theme again for the future years. All right. We're a favorite segment. We're going to finish it out with what we're reading and watching. Gerald, do you want to go first? Uh, yes, uh, keeping up my theme of only having ancient things to talk about, um, I was slightly shocked to see that it's almost the 50th anniversary of uh, this book, which is called The Ascent of Man by uh, Jacob Brunofsky. Um, in fact, I think it came out in 73, so not quite 50 years ago. This is a BBC uh, publication, came out at the time, um, but tied in with a TV series. Uh, Jacob Brunowski is uh, a fascinating character. I'm afraid he didn't live very long. He only lived into his mid-60s, and I think he died about a year after he completed this uh, fantastic... Well, it looks like it's such a massive book. Maybe did that put him over the edge? Well, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but it's a fantastic... It's a series, I think, of about 12 one-hour programs. Um, wow. it, it pops up all over the place. You'll find it on YouTube, completely unrestricted, and all the rest of it. And it just goes back to the basic principles principles of of how man has discovered things from fire to wheel to you know use of the horse uh, Pythagoras uh, understanding of geometry, which is far more than a bit we were all bored with as kids when we were looking out the window instead of concentrating on it. But there are all sorts of things, and then into the Renaissance and the Industrial Revolution and all the rest of it. And of course, it obviously it stops in the early 1970s, but it does stop just at the point where we're obviously on the cusp of the things happening in electronics and in his area, which he's very interested in, which was medicine. And um, so it's a it's 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 a big recommended book. Um, it's in print, uh, and it's a very easy read. I read it and bought it as a teenager, and I've never had a huge science bent. 
but it did re-engage me in science in a way that I otherwise if I hadn't watched it I, I might have slightly missed so it's it's kind of one of those books or at least a TV series you should you should try and read or listen to that's a great recommendation especially you know as we're finishing up the year and things will be slowing slowing down a bit um, seems like a good book to be sitting by the fire and pondering the yeah, future exactly. uh, and uh, my my what have I been viewing I've been viewing a, a series on BBC that's been out not very long a few weeks called Tokyo Vice um, and it's based on um, writings of an American journalist whose name I think is um, Jake Adelstein. I hate, think I've got that correct. Um, and he was uh, one of the very first non-Japanese journalists in Tokyo in the 1990s on a major newspaper. Um, and it's basically his experiences of investigating sort of the underworld in, in Tokyo and getting caught up with the Yakuza and everything. Uh, some people have suggested that he has over um, over egged the story and that he's uh, he's a bigger part in things in his book than was the reality <laughs> but that's something that's something we can all suffer from but it, it's a very good insight into that sort of underworld of japan so again well i love it especially with uh, japan being an important country in 2023 another great recommendation so what have you got on the... Uh, so I've got two books that I'm going to read over the break. Um, the first one is entitled The Optimist Telescope. Ah, that's, that's perfect for you then. Exactly. Just basically, you know, how to be more optimistic, how to delay gratification, um, you know, written by MIT professor Harvard Brown Henner, you know, all the good stuff. So uh, looking forward to reading that. Yeah. And then... This book's a few years old, but this is about basically the future of urban life. The okay. title of the book is The Well-Themed City, and uh, I don't know, right. it's the future of urbanization, architecture, design, uh, environment, whatnot. So two books. I'm going to be optimistic going into 23. And then, you know, I think uh, urbanization, infrastructure can be a big theme. So I think I'm excited yeah. to read those two books. Yeah, good. Good stuff. And um, that will... Well, between us, this should keep us quiet on, on a number of fronts, I would have thought. Yeah, hopefully uh, we can have a quiet few weeks here and get into 2023 without any anything too crazy. Yeah, and again, you're normally the person with on the board in terms of timetables. You've already mentioned, obviously, Turkish elections June next year. And of course, dare one say the whole... American bandwagon starts pretty much in the new year, doesn't it? Is that is that right? We've already had, yeah. I mean, President, former President Trump has declared, and uh, there was a story that somehow leaked today to CNN that Jill Biden is cool with uh, Joe oh. running for a second term. Um, I don't know. So, yeah, certainly we're going to have a new Speaker of the House. Somebody's going to be running the House in uh, January 3rd, a new Congress. And then, yeah, got to expect you're going to have a few dozen people throw their hats in to uh, be president of this great country. How exciting. And as you and as you say, it just always goes on. It never rests. So we just move on again. Democracy never rests. There we are. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess that's our, our wrap-up. Oh, so other than say friend, uh, friends in Italy, we're giving them one last – well, I'm not saying one last chance, but I don't know. It's, it's not looking good, I don't think. For, for whatever reason, it's not looking good. I still think we should go to Nippon TV. We've been sort of cozying up more towards Japan in a number of ways. We're going to give RII a few more weeks, and then we're going to all our loyalty will go to Japan for 2023. I think I think we may appeal to the Japanese because we're slightly more eccentric and off center, and they uh, they might like that. They may not like it, but let's hope. <laughs> all right, Joe. Thank you very much. Great chatting with you. We'll see you soon. Have a good holiday. Yeah, and same to you and everyone else. Take care. See you soon. Bye-bye. Ciao.